see it as my job to uh, try to stay on time, and I see it as your job to try and make sure that I don't stay on time. But I'll try and keep short answers if you interrupt me, which I encourage you to do. So, uh, given also that it's late in the day, I'm going to show a bunch of movies, and uh, here are the first three. So, for those of you who are familiar with uh, the two studio, and therefore call it Dicti, um, you probably know all these movies. And for those of you who are not, let me just explain them to you briefly. Um, what is shown is a time lapse in the upper left corner of the first 10 hours of development of roughly 1 million DQ stevia that are spread out on a um, six, 17 by 13 millimeter area of South Acre, which is an Acre air interface. They're starving, and as they're starving, they start to signal to each other the subject AMP. They chemotax towards each other, and that's what you're seeing. You see these uh, regions forming, and you can see the streaming of tens of hundreds of thousands of individuals that you see there into one uh, cluster, one mound. The movies are looping there, which you see. What's shown on the right-hand side is uh, the same movie as on the left-hand side, just shown at half the speed and only the uh, period of about two to seven hours, and it's framed to track it, a little bit like what, uh, what the oil is showing. Um, and, and therefore, you can really see these propagating waves as the dicti is moving forward. So when the when you see it moving forward, it, it becomes slightly stressed and therefore uh, slightly more um, permeable to light. And that's what it becomes clear here. Much later, meaning in the period of time from uh, 24 to roughly uh, 52 hours, um, these mounds will form slugs, and you can see them move around here. I don't uh, hesitate to call them slugs, they truly are slugs. Um, they will be, they can merge, if you see two of them pumped together, and they will form one slug. They might also spontaneously split up into two slugs. And this is essentially the, the multicellular stage uh, of the life cycle of the digestinium, which is otherwise a single cell organism when it's happy, um, which I'll go back to in a second. What is shown here um, is, a, is a wavelet analysis of the movie shown up here. You see, as a function of time during the development, the first roughly 10 hours, uh, you see how the, a, a periodicity appears. It goes from 10 minutes at, and then saturates at around the uh, developmental interesting part, which is here, at around 5 minutes. That's the periodicity with which um, psychic AMP is being secreted and the DT is uh, reacting to it. Okay, so much for the, for the social behavior, um, at least for the movie of that. This is a, just a beautiful snapshot of the different stages that Dicti goes through. Um, after the streaming forms a mount, the mount will sort of uh, rise up as a finger and then either fall out over as a slug that is uh, sensitive to temperature and light and photo tax and all kinds of taxes um, until it finds a nice place where it stand on its end uh, and go through <coughs> further development and the cells that were uh, leaving the slug, the first 20% uh, will form the stalk and you'll see this beautiful uh, fruiting body or flower-like structure that looks like this if you get a, a, a nice uh, electron micrograph of it. And uh, all the cells here in the middle, the stalk cells, the formal needles, they die. They don't make it. Whereas the 8% that are in the fruiting body form this uh, spore-like structure, and they, will, uh, they can go on and propagate the DNA and in the, to the next generation, next generation of themselves, um, when better times appear. Better times uh, is something like this. Here it took a fruiting body and just dumped it on a, on a surface that was coated by bacteria. The fruiting body will sense that. It will basically sprout out these spores that will come out of the dormant state and start eating. They will divide, they will divide, 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 divide. It sets up this uh, traveling wave of a feeding front, <coughs> essentially wipes clean um, the surface of these whole bacteria on the wave. So this is again, this is shown at roughly uh, 900 times, no, exactly 900 times real time, so one second gets 15 minutes real time. Okay. However, you probably want to avoid going through this whole developmental cycle if you can at any, in any way avoid it. Simply because uh, the numbers are not exactly against you, but not straightforward, but not quite for you either. 20% of you are not going to make it. So if you can, you're going to try and stay out of that phase. And to stay out of that phase, you just have to feed. Right? You have to go out and find some food. And if you're not, essentially, if you're not, if you're not sitting on it, you have to find it. 
And that means you need some kind of search strategy. Now, there is no such thing as uh, the best search strategy. Not in nature, not in computer science, nowhere. It will all depend on the problem you're trying to solve. So when you say the best search strategy, we mean for the given conditions. <laughs> so, so, so people have shown in, uh, in computer science that uh, they came up with this no free lunch theory that shows that there is no such thing as the best search strategy, um, which tells us that the strategy we come up with must, must somehow match the underlying problem set, which is now the distribution of food. And since the distribution of food will also be modified over time, you would probably be better off if you can also modify the search strategy as a function of time. So here showing two examples of the possible distributions of food. They can even be sort of randomly scattered. You see, these are the targets, and this is our fearsome uh, uh, predator, Pitti, going to pick up these individual bacteria that feeds them. Or you could have clusters of bacteria that you're trying to find. Now, depending on, on just in these two cases, there are two different studies that would be optimal. It's quite clear what the optimal strategy is here. You just have to walk straight. You walk straight, you never double over your own path. And therefore, you never waste any time searching an area where you know, as a fact, that there is no food which has just been there. So a straight line is the best strategy in this case. In a case where you have clusters of food, a straight line is the best strategy to find a cluster. But once you hit a cluster, you better switch your strategy to something like a more local search. Otherwise, you're going to just plow through and get out of the cluster. And that is not very smart, and that's where the food was. So, the whole uh, idea of, uh, of search strategies, of course, has been studied in, in many other systems, uh, maybe most famously, uh, lately, uh, the case of the albatross, um, where people showed that uh, extensively, published in nature a couple of times, um, that there's something like, in the first major publication, a power law in the, in the flight times, so it's a lot of plot of the flight duration, and then the uh, uh, histogram here, then there's a lot of plot, and then a couple of years later on reanalysis, and quite a lot of plot. Anyway, that's just a warning that you should be very careful with the analysis. Um, there are other possible search strategies. Uh, people have come up with a um, sort of a two phase kind of search strategy where you will translate first, and you switch to a different uh, stage where you're searching locally, and you either find something or you don't, and you spontaneously switch out of the state again and translocate without searching. So there are plenty of models out there trying to describe um, search strategies. So um, these are all essentially, all, these are, all the data that exists so far have been from reasonably uh, large structures, such as albatross bumblebees. Bumblebees are not as big as deer, of course, but they're still not exactly microscopic, um, which simply means you don't do these kind of experiments in the lab. In addition to that, you cannot easily control the environment when you do experiments like this. You have to go out and take the data uh, where the system is found. So we thought we would try and, uh, and ask all the same questions to this uh, well-studied system of, of PT, uh, which has the great advantage that we can actually we can control the microenvironment. We can, if not exactly pattern, then at least control the density of the local food sources. So what is shown here is a single cell, the same cell before and after, I presented with food. So on the left hand side, no food, it's quite clear. The cell is, uh, the movie is not looping, the stage, the microscope stage is being repositioned automatically whenever the cell reaches the edge of the field of view. Let me just show it again though. Whoops, that's the wrong direction. Better. So at the same playback speed on the left and right. On the right hand side, there's a density of roughly 0.02 bacteria per square micrometer. And you can see that the cell does a pretty good job cleaning up after itself. If it needs a bacteria, it eats a bacteria. And now what we want to um, find out is what does this correspond to in, in terms of search strategy. So we set about trying to quantify um, the data we collect. So first, I just show you the, the path taken. So for the first uh, for the first hundred minutes of the of the run, when there's no food, this would be the xy positions. And in the present of food, it looks like this. It is roughly the same scales um, here 
I can now show you 170 microns, and here it was 150, 160 microns. I don't know whether you agree with me, but to me they look not quite the same. So the, the clinic must, there's, there's some difference. Not only does the path look different, but also uh, first simple measures such as the mean speed differ um, markedly here. So it drops roughly by a factor of two and then percent uh, addictive with food. So just very briefly, in the case of no food, we actually uh, went through uh, a bunch of time series of that that was done with, uh, with a grad student in, in the lab, who was her data, and I only was involved in, in the data analysis of that part. Um, we found that the instantaneous uh, direction of motion, which is uh, depicted in the time series, the black line is the direction at any given time. So you see how that sort of fluctuates positively stochastically, and then also has a slower component to so it. The blue line is just drawn by hand. We can roughly describe that as a, as a random walk of the blue line with an additional um, noise that we would say is a harmonic noise, um, which essentially is a signal of differential equation. If we do that, um, we can get the power spectrum, we can fit that pretty well. We can also uh, build histograms of the instantaneous angles. You can see we have a nice little um, a flashing distribution of double exponential distribution of turn angles. And we can show that the turns are also uh, anti correlated in time, which means that the cell can actually be really straight. Uh, it does that by making a left turn and a right turn, a left turn and a right turn, and that's the way how it, how it zigzags its, its way forward. Now, um, more details can of course be found uh, in, in the publication listed there. So, let me show a little bit about uh, the, the foraging cell now. This is the main difference between the foraging or rather an eating and non-eating uh, digestion. You know, as a function of time, you can plot the number of bacteria that you eat, we can measure that directly from the time series. And what you see is one of the limitations to getting a long time series is simply that after a period of time, the cell divides. If eating enough, it divides. Now you're tracking, well, not exactly the cell itself, not its daughter either, they're like sisters, but you have two new cells and you track one of them, after a period of time it's eaten enough, and that will divide again. I better speed up. Um, the time series like that, for these uh, position plots, you can measure the, the mean square displacement in the case of no food, and food is a double of the plots. The full line here is a slope of two that would correspond to ballistic motion, and the uh, dashed line here corresponds to diffusion. Neither of these are actually quite what is taking place, so if you look at the local slope, the distal arithmetic derivative of the mean square displacement, you will get something that looks like this in the case of food and food and no food again. You see a transition from ballistic motion to something that looks like a silver boring random walk, and then a crossover to lack of data, but essentially um, also just diffusive motion. In the presence of food, you see the same kind of crossover, but this plateau seems to be dragging on for a longer time, so it's self avoiding for a much more extended period of time. So three time scales, uh, persistence of roughly one to two minutes, self-avoidance of up to 10 minutes, and then in the case of food, further self-avoidance that can basically go on forever. I'm going to skip over this one and this one and show you just what we think is the reason why we have this self-avoidance at very long time scales. So cell avoidance at very long time scales in the presence of food seems to be simply because the cell has cleaned up all the bacteria meeting on its way. And given the choice between moving into a region where there's no food and a region where there is food, it's going to move towards the food. That's what you're seeing here. You see that the gestilia uh, hitting a cluster of food and it stays in that food until it's cleaned up. It never actually exits it. Um, it gets close to the border, but it will not exit. Given the choice, it stays on the food. In the growing state, we have this at least uh, two different kinds of search behavior. One, when there's no food, it take, the cell takes reasonably long and straight runs, searching for the food, trying to find the first single uh, bacteria. 
Um, and once it's uh, hit stats, if it's a cluster, it'll stay on it. If it's a single, bit, uh, single bacteria, it'll just scoop it up and continue. In case of more abundant, fil more abundant food, um, it'll perform some kind of local search. It doesn't move as fast. It slows down. It doesn't clean itself after itself um, and stays on the food, never going back into empty regions. Acknowledgement, the people, the money, and thank you. Okay, are there any questions? to change its behavior? Excellent question. No real idea. It, it certainly doesn't have a brain, right? So one of the reasons why we are studying Dicti, and one of the advantages of Dicti, is that if we see any kind of complicated behavior, any kind of adaptation to the environment, we at least know that it's not something it's think, thinking about. It's a cat. Right? It must all be hardwired. So one reason why, it, one way it can change its behavior once it encounters food it's simply that it doesn't have a separate mouth and food. It eats with what it's walking on. So when it encounters a food, it has to uh, engulf it, phagocytose it. And at some point, it's going to get very full. And moves by a polymerization beside the skeleton. And if that gets too crowded in there, that's not going to be a very efficient way of moving. So it slows down. That's our idea. But it doesn't just move slower. It changes the shape of its path. Right. So it moves. It moves slower, that was uh, what I will answer first. Uh, the change in path, we think, is that it does a little bit of local uh, chemotaxi. So it can smell a very nearby bacterium, and it will send out a pseudopod to scoop up that one. And once it sends out one pseudopod, it's sort of broken. It's, it's symmetry and tends to sort of try and go in that direction. Right? So this introduces uh, a, an, an increase in the randomness, in the short time randomness. Right? So, Persistence is, is, uh, is much shorter. The persistence is basically set by uh, the length scale of the, the density of the food of the surface. Okay. Any more questions? It looked like that the bacteria keeps on eating. Does it stop or? <laughs> when, you say, when you say bacteria, do you mean the bacteria or do you mean? The big guy. The big guy. The big guy. Okay. <laughs> Not a bacteria. Um, it becomes ill-defined because once it has eaten enough, it divides and becomes two. <laughs> but uh, it'll, it'll essentially be only pause for, for, the, for the briefest period of time, which is about um, 10, 20 minutes. Oops. Sorry now. So there's a plateau here that is less than half an hour. The cell divides, and they both take off and start eating again. But it, it, no, it's essentially it's never full. Once it's, <laughs> once it's full, it becomes two. Just two brief questions. So first, when you showed the, the trajectories, the displacement, the displacement as function of time, this is the average of many trajectories, yes? Or, or this is just one trajectory? The mean square displacement? Yes. I mean, it is exactly, this is just one cell. This is, not uh, this is just for one cell. Just one cell. Ah, I see. You have a reasonably high data, so you can take a picture every five seconds, and you take uh, movies for several hours. So at least, at least down here at short time lags, and um, we have good statistics. Here, uh, this is just noise. And the second question is, uh, have you measured the proliferation? Does that depend on, on whether you have food or not? They certainly do not uh, um, grow and divide if there's no bacteria. Uh, we, we are doing all these experiments on well, essentially nutrient-free agar. Um, so they will run around and they will essentially, they will, not, they will not slow down for the first 10 hours. They seem quite happy to just run around looking for food that we know is not there. They won't. Um, so they're searching. After some 10 hours, they tend to slow down a little bit, but they will still be fully active, most of them after 24 hours. But they don't divide, right? So, yeah, one last question, though. Very quick. I just wondered, 
uh, if these MSDs, you have a red line and a blue line, and uh, previously you showed us the, 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 the raw data and the smooth data, D does right. the red line correspond to yeah. okay. the MSD so of the smooth data, or is it the smooth MSD of the raw data? Understand that. Let me just tell you what it is. <laughs> the blue line is the raw data where the mean square space has been calculated in non overlapping windows. The red is for uh, both, both smooth and now the mean square space is calculated in, in sliding overlapping windows. Okay. But the data has been smooth, doesn't make any difference uh, when you go beyond uh, a minute. Right? That doesn't play any difference. Playing a role. It's only up here uh, that you can see a difference uh, because. Using the non-overlapping or overlapping windows. Okay, one, one last question and the rest go to the discussion. It should be quick. What about varying food densities? Have you looked at that or are you going to? I did. I didn't have a, um, enough convincing data to create to put one plot together that I was so proud of. Um, but we varied them roughly um, two orders of magnitude or to put them two orders of magnitude. Very briefly, um, when there's just a tiny amount of food, meaning it's going to encounter um, one bacterium every, say, 50 micrometers, which is five, uh, five cell diameters, the cells seem to speed up a little bit, which doesn't make sense. They get a little bit, they get like a little drop of sugar water. If, uh, if you encourage them to speed up. But otherwise, they don't seem to change much of the statistics of their behavior. And then as the acidity increases uh, beyond that, um, they will start slowing down again and more rapidly. And at the, at the highest possible density, um, they don't move very much. Uh, and they're happy where they are. Okay, so let's send the speaker around the speaker. So, this <laughs> bacterial, bacterial suspension, biofilms, of course, we just learned that it's not just bacteria. <laughs> okay. Okay, we're back. So we, we just learned it's not just bacterial. There's some other unicellular organisms that uh, can function and, uh, and interact in sort of in, in, in cohort or sometimes individually. So what, oh, one thing I would like to emphasize for again physics community of here is that those sort of unicellular organisms that often act in cohort and uh, or at least ne live nearby and sometimes cooperate, is sort of the most common life form on Earth. So about, I think I've heard last year, 95% of the biomass uh, of life are bacteria, and they are either bacterial biofilms that live on the rocks and in the, in the soils, or they are this bacteria, the, the cyanobacteria that photosynthesize in the middle of the ocean. So many of those involve multiple species, many bacterial biofilms are associated with 75 of, of infection. And it's what, what's really interesting is that how, 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 how different sort of bioscientists looked at them and how it, at this point it kind of started coming back to this original sort of naturalist approach. So back in 1800s, maybe 1700s, all the way to 1960s, all people could do and were doing is do this naturalist approach, just watch them carefully, try to understand what they observed, record, and maybe analyze with some limited determinant. Then the DNA evolution came about, the molecular biology it came about, the genetic approaches can, can buy, and, and all the microbiological community, they stopped really caring about what's really going on. They stopped in many aspects to take, to take movies and stuff. All they were caring about sort of molecular details. Let's see what genes are doing. Let's focus on single molecule, maybe single radio, single pathways. And on the other hand, the mathematical biology community came up with some sort of quite successful phenomenological models that sort of explain in such phenomenological details what was going on, like color of Siegel equations that were uh, mentioned at the talk. And right now, with the DNA approach, the system approaches came, came, came back, and then we, we come back with a biophysical model that, again, start uh, going back to those original naturalist approaches. And now we can, with the microscopy in the States, we can view the single cells and even single molecules in view of observation. So we, we can do the same thing that people are doing, we can see this with much higher precision. 
So, and what it really came out from the session, from my view, it looks like like physics community and biological community, they kind of look at this problem with, with, with two different uh, angles of this. So, what the biologists want, they really, and the quote from Cindy Brenner summarizes it pretty well. They they want to connect the pre and po uh, they want to connect the phenotype and genotype, and the problem phase of pre and post genomic genetics are pretty much the same. You want to see how the genotype translates to the just mentioned behaviors. So, what do the physicists want? And uh, the, the joke that we used to have in Russia is just to satisfy their own curiosity with government funding, or sometimes without. We all struggle around here. And but seriously, it's kind of the new mesoscopic laws. We are looking for organizing principles. We are looking for something that's really not molecule dependent. We want tar receptor to function the same as the other receptor. On the other hand, bi biologists know those receptors for a reason. So the question that biologists are asking is, what's what what what, what what's really the difference between those receptors? What's 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 common? So it looks like uh, it, it, it's two, it's kind of two di different approaches. Uh, some physicists want to abstract. Biologists want more details. So the question is, uh, how do we do it together? How do we try to work together and answer those questions? And I was thinking that can sort of do it. So should physicists care about the genetics? Should we care about genes? Should we care about mutations? Uh, should biologists care about physical mechanics, hydrodynamics, elasticity, optimal surface strategy, and etc.? So I think th 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 those are very interesting question to talk about today, so I would like to ask speakers to come back to this stage and maybe share their opinions, and everyone is welcome to participate. So what do you guys think? Should, are we really asking two different questions to work together, or is there any, any, any hope of not of consolidation, but sort of bringing some questions that are related to both of the communities? served on committees and written grants, I actually think that the more that I try to work outside my comfort zone, the, the less the funding agencies like it. Um, I think the answer is, yeah, of, of course mathematicians should care about genetics and, and biologists should care about mathematics because, I mean, it's all science, right? But the question is, you know, if, let's say, somebody like me that's made something of a career of stumbling around, not doing anything terribly well, but doing whatever interests me, you know, if I can't, if I have a difficult time getting funded, isn't it that I come back to what I'm comfortable at and what I know will work? I don't know if that's true also with the computational guys, but I know that that's true with the biology guys. So, I know, if there's no more comment, I mean, we're open to any questions or anyone's opinion. Anyone wants to speak up? Yeah. yeah, I mean, so I actually, the last talk um, what was uh, sort of triggered things in my head that are going to be shown in Ian Cousins' talk on flocculation. So when you looked at your dictostelium, um, those slugs are essentially made up of individuals, and it looked like there were some individuals that were essentially leading the pack towards food particles. Is that how I think about it? I mean, you mentioned lamellopodia, but I don't. This isn't a cell that has, you know, an outreaching arm. All right, so let's start with the slug. The, the slug is uh, does consist of up to 100,000 individual cells, and there are leaders. Roughly, the 20% the of the cells that are in the tip of the slug are those who decide where the slug is going. Now, if you take a slug like that and cut it in two. The second half will do spontaneously develop a new group of leaders, and you will again have a tip. Right. 
And those, again, that tip, those are the ones that are going to die when you go through the rest of the development program and, and you form your recruiting body. Um, yeah, no, so following the comment on the, you know, trying to manipulate the food sources, uh, I mean, in Ian's talk, I, I don't know, are you going to talk about that tomorrow, Ian? About leaders going to different food sources? Yeah, yeah, I will. Yeah, so I, I think it'll be interesting to compare uh, with what you all see because it, it looks very similar to we even talked a few weeks ago. Um, now, the select doesn't actually look for food. It looks for a place, uh, in a sense, to die. A, a good place to uh, to form a fooding body. Um, it's only the individual cells that are, that are known to directly look for food. And whether they communicate in the, when they go about their business, I don't know. I don't even know that it is known or not. Um, it is known that they tend, depending on the species again, that individual cells tend to repel each other a little bit. But whether they send out a different signal once they find the food source, I don't know. Um. Uh, so just a follow-up to the, I don't know if you just, so the slugs, when they, you said they, were, they search for places to form green bodies, but um, if they find food instead, do they, the individual amoebas branch out and start duplicating again. So I didn't talk about that now because I don't know essentially. Um, I think uh, they pretty much become dedicated to um, forming a fooling body, and it takes a, a rather strong uh, clue for them to change to change their opinion and go back to form the individuals that just in the market. <coughs> I certainly know that the fruiting body has a certain system. Once you form a fruiting body, it will wait for, uh, I think, 8, 12 hours before you can challenge it and make it uh, uh, burst open and start over again. Even if you're sending it good stuff um, shortly after it's formed its fruiting body. Somebody knows more? Go ahead. Do you know more about things you don't I don't know anything about things you It's almost like your system. I agree, we should write a paper on that. <laughs> Are the individuals within a slug genetically identical? And what happens if you introduce heterogeneity within an experiment? So people have done that. This, this is turning out to be, to be a dicky discussion, it seems. Um, anyway, <laughs> good for me. Everyone um, remembers the last talk fast, so. Yeah. Um, so people have done experiments where they have uh, Competed two strains against each other. One that, uh, that tries to avoid forming the stalk. Remember, the stalk is uh, those are the ones who die, right? So they essentially have, uh, have cheaters in the population. And then they uh, analyze it from a, from a mathematical game theoretical point of view. You'll find a nature paper from 10, 20 years ago that looks at that. So uh, the different strains do have ways of distinguishing between themselves and others. Um, not only do they uh, prefer to go to themselves, on the cheetahs, of course, but they also try to keep out the others. Uh, so there are mechanisms of, of keeping yourself alive. On the uh, swimming near walls, is there what's the velocity dependence to that, or is that distribution that you came is that independent of velocity in these low Reynolds numbers? So in fact, in this. The, the, the velocity distribution does not even appear in this in this graph. So in fact, the so there hasn't been a lot of experiments measuring the velocity dependence. There's been, I think, um, people have looked at it for E. coli, and there's a strong wall dependence. But that's as far as I know. So the velocity, you know, if you're swimming in circles near the wall, then you go a little slower than if you're swimming in circle or, or straight away from the wall. Friction goes up. In general, that leads to swimming going down. Uh, there have been a couple of papers. Um, by uh, Rosanne Bijan, I think is her name, a microbiologist from Virginia, and I think that's, that's about it. So, but your theory says it should be independent of velocity? Well, um, my theory says that, it, in some sense, my theory is a far field theory, sort of, the, sort of the first effect of the wall. The first effect of the wall is you think of the cell as a flow disturbance with a given strength, and then you ask, the, right, that's, that's the flow that you would have away from the wall, and you ask the question, well, what is the first effect of the wall? The first effect of the wall is for a given strength that you're applying gives you an attraction that's proportional to this, to this full strength. Now, of course, what I call P, my dipole, 
which roughly speaking scales like um, you know the drag on the cell times the size of the cell. And the velocity is changing, the drag is changing, so, the, so that means that the, the, the strength of this abstraction is also going in value. It will, the, the important thing is that it will always go in the same direction. You know, whether it goes up a factor of two, goes down a factor of two. But of course, course you're fit so well to the to the sperm data. Yeah, so that means that I mean my, my interpretation is that the essential physics is there, and then and then you know one thing that my data of course doesn't my data I should say our data doesn't do so well is that my model diverges exponentially at the wall. It's a far field model, so strictly speaking, at z equals zero, it's x infinite. So you know there are things that we need to worry about within basically one body length of the wall. So the last 10 microns or 5 microns, which is the length of the, the cell blood the flagellum, we don't do a good job there because our far field quote unquote approximation doesn't, doesn't, it's not anymore. So what, we are get, the, what are the biological implications? I mean, if you're swimming, if you're a sperm doing whatever you're doing, yeah. how big are the, you know, how far are the walls from you on average? I mean, you must be getting into narrow tubes or? Correct. Well, in, in fact, you don't even need to get into narrow tubes. This shows that even if you're in yeah. big tubes, you end up at near the wall. So that seems kind of dumb. I mean, if I was a sperm, I wouldn't want to swim. And my job was to get upstream. I wouldn't want to swim in the high viscous, you know, high drag area. I mean, uh, speaking. I mean, I mean, so. <laughs> <laughs> so but in some sense, what this shows is that, I mean, and perhaps that answers or at least addresses some of those questions. There are some physical consequences of being an organism that exploits fluid forces for swimming that you just can't avoid. And that's one example. And so whether you're a pusher, so you, first of all, there's no force, so you, 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 you're a dipole, that's always true. Whether you're pushing against the fluid or you're pulling against the fluid, you always end up near the wall for two different reasons. One is because you're attracted, the other one because you end up crashing into the wall. But this, uh, this is the, something that you cannot avoid. And so. Uh, perhaps there's a way to design something that has no inertia that can be repelled by the wall. So, okay. but basically, I mean, this is this is an example of sort of physics. You could have, you could have feedback and the sure. could like say, oh, I don't want to be near the wall. Of course, and then you could st you can basically change the way you stir yourself, right? So I'm just asking, what's the answer? I mean, you know, when you measure, you know, if you're a spermatologist and you're measuring it in actual whatever the channels are called. Well, the different channels. <laughs> I don't know. Look at yeah. the tubes, yes. Yeah. There's the uterus. There's the Do, tubes. Are they like all near the surface there? Well, that's where they stay. They wait for the oven on the wall. So in some sense, they use the fact that there's the swim. Uh, they want to be near the wall because, I mean, as you know, so it takes, I don't know how much you know about the biology of reproduction. It takes a couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> from, that point of view. from that point of view, okay. So <laughs> there, there, it takes a couple of hours between insemination for mammals, from between insemination ins, ins, to all the way to basically where the cells are going to wait. They're going to wait, they're going to go through the cervical mucus, through the cervix, they're going to go up the uterus, they're going to go through this entrance of the fallopian tubes, which is uh, full of mucus, and then they're going to go, go up the fallopian tubes, and then they're going to wait. And they can wait there uh, for up to, I think, something like three days. And, yeah, and they stay at the wall, and they undergo a number of chemical and physical changes, but they are, they are of the epithelium, they stay there. And then, you know, the encounter with the egg, if it happens, the open one, if it happens, happens there. So they have to be at the wall because that's where they stay there. That's why they're protected. In fact, that's the only place they're protected. Otherwise, and that's why they have to hurry up because, the, in fact, the um, as far as I know, and I'm not a biologist, so you know, take this with a pinch of salt. This, the, uh, the, the 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 female body actually all the way until when this, the the sperm cells are stored uh, in the fallopian tubes attacks the, the sperm with uh, as a as a human, uh, immune response basically all the way until they're stored inside the fallopian tubes and then they're protected. So that's why they really happen. Hurry up. Uh, I think that uh, the answer to both of these questions is, is yes, to some extent. Uh, to me, I think, the, because I'm more on leaning towards physics, I guess, the second one, uh, the physicists, I think, try to find some universality as to what sort of minimum rules of physics that I should put in so that, for example, I could see a collective behavior and so on. And I think that's an important uh, kind of uh, line of research because you find a lot of interesting things that doesn't require uh, you know, invoking special genetics or uh, for me to explain. And I guess uh, a biologist who is interested in understanding 
a more fundamental biological phenomena would have to separate things out that that would have been more generically can be explained. So I think uh, the need for both of them to understand each other is, is definitely there. Uh, and I, I guess uh, the kind of work that Ming Ming uh, presented uh, to me, where you try to do all, everything, uh, is, is, is the kind of thing that you, know, you could do. That's really nice because uh, uh, I think the, the truth might be somewhere in between in that uh, the environmental or physical factors are just as important as biological factors. And uh, you might have a number of ways that you can explain uh, swarming or collective behavior, but unless you, you know, identify exactly what's happening uh, at the molecular and biological level, you will never share it. Uh, Eric, um, very interesting about the uh, the attraction of the uh, bacteria to the wall. Um, I was wondering, you, you briefly mentioned that uh, the the, uh, the the bacteria gets uh, the your theory break down when, when the bacteria get too close to the wall, um, and you said it's about one body length or one length of the bacteria. Is that correct? Well, that's what I'm saying. Whether it's correct or not, basically, <laughs> basically, you know, anything that's far field, there's a length scale. It's the size of the, of the cell, and so anything that's far field is, is valued asymptotically far away from the cell, as the cell is a point. But roughly speaking, it should remain valued almost even quantitatively up to one body length. As soon as you're within the you know, circle of one body length, then you actually see the detail, the geometry of the cell, and then you actually have to remember everything, the three-dimensionality, and then all the high-order um, effects, hydraulic effects that Nimi talked about. Like, High order singularities, etc. All of this becomes uh, important, and then you cannot do this on a piece of paper. Okay. And, 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 yeah, and, and, and for, for, so for for the theory you presented, basically there are two mechanisms. One is the the attractive force, and the other one is the real orientation. Correct. And do you expect the <coughs> basically the uh, the breakdown of the theory to occur about the same distance for both of them? Well, yes. they're both they both been derived under the same sort of regime, so yes. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And, and so I, I, the, the one question I have was, you can say that well, there is an attractive force by just looking at the concentration profile, but there is no, you didn't present any kind of experimental evidence in terms of the reorientation. No. Um, do you know, aware of anybody well, who was, observed that? Um, that's a good question, I don't know. The problem is that after a certain time scale, which is one over omega, if omega the rotation rate, it should be done. To within some fluctuations by rotational diffusion, you should be done. So you really would have to do an experiment to somehow you could clearly see you can clearly say where well, here's t equals zero, and then from t equals zero I can follow the evolution in time of the orientation of the population. And this was a summer experiment and we just we just didn't think of the, the clever way, fast way to do that. This is an ex it would be a very interesting um, uh, data. Uh, but I do not know of anybody who's done that. Thank you. So, so let, let me ask a question now. But so, so do, 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 I sort of coming back to the, the, the points raised is, do, do you really think that this is a physiologically important effect? And do you, can you give examples, like, for, okay, for bacteria? So we talk about this term. Do you think for bacteria is a physiologically <laughs> important effect? And can you think about a situation in which it would be evolution beneficial? to be attracted to the wall versus not being attracted to the wall? So I'm not a biologist, and so I really have a hard time telling you, frankly. I mean, so I know more, I, I know about reproduction because I just find this interesting, so I learn, I, I just, the biology of it, and I learn, you know, like what we discussed. And, and um, I know that it could be important, I, I've seen some paper discuss that, of course, the distribution of nutrients near near surface is different than the distribution of nutrients away from the wall. And so, for that, in that regard, it could be important to passively be attracted to the wall because if, if the nutrient distribution is is, you know, is, is better or is, is more concentrated or something, then passively, without even doing any chemotactics, that that's what would you end up. But beyond that, I I I don't I mean, personally, I don't have a strong opinion either way, just because I'm just not a biologist. I, so. It would be hard for me. I mean, I could say yes, it's extremely important. And in fact, you know, every biologist really should read my paper. But you know, no. 
I wanted to ask about the second part of your talk. But you had the two planes, but um, what happens if you just have two flagella or two cilia? Yes. Um, does your analysis apply? Because it's very different geometry. So what's different? Okay, so there are two things that are, that are different. Cilia is completely different. Cilia cannot move past each other. So cilia are embedded into the boundary, mm -hmm. and they're beating and you know, if they don't have this degree of freedom, one can swim faster or slower than the other. So for cilia, to get a phase locking, you need to have a mechanism that, you know, if this is cilia A and this is cilia B, this is what I said earlier, you need to have a mechanism that says, well, whatever is doing the beating in cilia A needs to take into account the fact that there's another one that creates a flow field. This flow field creates a force distribution. And so you have, a, basically, you have, need to have a force generation whatever those, the moments, distribution, etc., that is load dependent. That is depending on the fact that if I'm here and there's a guy right here beating very fast, it gives me a load, it's very different than this, this guy right here. So for Celia, you need this feedback. And there have been some papers, uh, quite a number of papers that have demonstrated that, that you need this feedback. Okay, I mean, in, in the um, E. coli, if you spin one way, right, you, you, the flagella move together and then the Correct. Only swims and Correct. If it rotates the other way then it tumbles. Correct. So how come in one case the flagella seem to be in synchrony, you rotate the other way and they're not in allowing the thing to tumble? Well the the equivalent here would be um, the equivalent here would be if I have a waveform, I'm giving you a waveform and I'm telling you it's a waveform for which the stable situation is the in phase. If I flip the direction of the wave, which would be the same thing as if I have a helix and I rotate one way, I suddenly flip the direction in which this, those helices are rotating, then what was stable becomes unstable, and what's unstable becomes stable. Okay, so it's purely geometry. You know, if you have a wave that is asymmetric formed back one way, if you flip the direction in which the wave is propagating, then the asymmetry becomes completely reverse. You have to actually flip the page to see the problem, and what was stable is now becoming unstable. And so there have been a, a lot of work, uh, people in physics and you know, fluid and solid mechanics interested about this, so the issue of geometry of rotating helices, how do they interact, etc. And it's essentially, it's it's very similar. It's not at all the same analysis, but it's very similar. A lot of it is geometry. It's, it's, and you can say a lot just by the geometry. Can I add on to this? So there is a, a fun experiment you can do to prove what you just asked about. So if you take, uh, um, say, three coils, like uh, hard wire, and you make three coils, identical coil, and if you uh, flip them counterclockwise, they'll rotate smoothly, they, they synchronize. If you rotate them clockwise, they jam. So it's, a, it's an asymmetry in, in the helix. So it's a, it's a very fun experiment. I, uh, I, I use this to demonstrate with my uh, seven-year-old daughter when I go to the to elementary school. But they have to be floppy wires or, or No, the hard one. So, so take yeah, like the, the hard wire, the uh, closer hanger would be a good uh, material to start with. But it's it's quite interesting that they really move smoothly if you if you become clockwise. It is it's just geometry, it's no hydrodynamic here. Just no, no, yeah. It is. It's just symmetry. Mm -hmm. It's uh, because the yeah, just like it's so the, the part of it which is hydrodynamics is if one of is right here, one is right there, and you start rotating them, then eventually it will end up together. This part to go from that to this part, then you need other hydrodynamics. And, or you just need to do it by hand, but you need something to put them together. Okay, so any more questions? Does the wall effect we've been talking about affect the distributions for the chemotaxi stuff uh, from Lindley's talk? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. That's related. Yeah. <laughs> I only recently actually read your paper. You're talking about the biophysical paper, right? The chemo yeah. chemotaxi the profile with the fit with the. I don't know the answer to that. So, uh, in our case, we uh, always measure our. Uh, uh, our cell in the middle of the, in the middle of the, uh, of the device. So it's actually the wall effect is very clear that um, the, even though we didn't 
But it, it is uh, very clear. So, uh, but it's a, yeah, we haven't uh, varied the height. It would be an interesting experiment to do to look at whether chemotaxis is influenced by the war effect. The, my intuitive feeling is, is not, because the, uh, um, eventually, the, uh, after equilibrium is reached, they should, they, should, uh, they should not depend on the speed that, with which they are swimming. So, uh, but it's, uh, yeah, it's an interesting interpretation. So, so did you do a control with uh, no, camp no gradient and what's the distribution distribution look like? Uh, no chemical gradient, it's, uh, uh, it's uniform. So you don't have a wall effect then? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm saying X, Y plane, but the in Z plane, yes. The, it's always there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a very... Okay. So this is for the um, this uh, distance. Um, this is for Roy's talk. So um, I was actually surprised that there are so few observables that people have. Uh, figured out for all of these uh, genes. And so I guess the question is, um, I mean, is there a concerted strategy that one takes to find these observables, or is it just, you know, by happenstance? I mean, how, <coughs> yeah, and, and what's sort of optimal for a given gene? How do you even start to, you know, plot that trajectory? Observable meaning observable phenotypes. Phenotypes, yeah. So I, I, if, if I if I stated it that way, I misstated it a bit. It's not just observable; it's quantifiable. Right. And so there's lots of there's lots of phenotypes where people will say, "Oh, that looks a little weird." But um, but then if at the end of the day you have fruiting bodies with spores in it, they declare as wild type or wild type like. So um, that's it. Uh, most of molecular biology, microbiology for the past couple of decades has been based on uh, the preliminary data has been usually with some sort of screen. And so you're, you're screening for a phenotype. And so you, you pull up uh, a handful of genes that, that have the phenotype you, des you desire, you sequence those genes, and those are the ones you study. The, the, the hard part, at least in Mexico, came up when you had the whole genome, and you know the gene that you've been studying for five years was an ECF signal factor, and you find that you have 27 more, so you, you knock out all of those 27, and none of them have phenotypes. Right. I guess what I'm asking is, you know, in biology, are there standard screenings uh, you know, that people sort of use, or is it sort of anything goes? You know, how much of it is visual? Uh, you know, phenotypes like the ones that you're sort of describing based on visual analysis versus chemical analysis versus something else. Right, so the, the, the data, you know, the, sort of the idea, the difference between a screen and a selection. So I mean, you know, a, a screen, can, this can be for anything as long as, as it's a, it, it's something that can be used to differentiate the thing you want from the thing that you don't. And so, so no, there, I mean, there's no set, set thing that you can use, but it, it has to obey the criteria so that you know, you can, you can use that for, for a screen. I mean, it, it just has to be something where you can grow lots of an organism and then be able to figure out very quickly which one is the one you want based on something quantifiable, usually. Um, just on a related note, uh, you asked a question about the phenotype um, or, or, or Roy's Ro uh, answer about phenotype. Reminded me of... Um, uh, I think a, a big problem in um, that, that I, I, I come across in interacting with uh, biologists uh, is that um, their standard of phenotype is different often. It is something just visual, like, for example, if a bacillus subtilis biofilm, it's a wrinkled or is it not wrinkled? If it's wrinkled, it's a biofilm. If it's not wrinkled, it's some lab strain that has lost the biofilm phenotype. But you know, that might not be the right phenotype. The right phenotype might be, is it a solid or a fluid? You know, does it give or does it resist uh, stri you know, strain? Um, and so, you know, these, these questions here about the physicists caring about genetics or biologists caring about physics, I think uh, in a large part we can help each other out right there in terms of, um, you know, understanding materials, properties, things. 
understanding what differentiates a solid from a fluid, all these things, and um, uh, uh, honing down what we call our phenotype. I mean, you had this exact same problem, right, with, with, with asking, out of all of these different uh, behaviors in, 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 in uh, Mixo, like, what is the right one to look for? You know, and I think this is where maybe we can all help one another tremendously without having to say whether we care about genetics. You know? Well, it, it, I mean, the way, the way that I describe it to my students is that the, the problem, if, you, if you, the phenotype that you're looking at isn't quantifiable, then you can't compare three things. And so the example I always use is, you know, if you, if you have a room full of 10 people and you ask, you know, to rank those 10 people based on who's tallest, that's easy. But if you ask to rank them based on who's nicest, that's that's a little harder. If you have two people, you can say one's nicer than the other. But it, when you get three people, it's hard to stick the one in the middle, you know. Yeah. Um, and so so that you need numbers for. And and you're right. The, the problem is that once, like with wrinkled or not wrinkled phenotypes, uh, you know, Phenotypes like that, unless you come up with some quantifiable metric, it's sort of like porn, you know, when you see it. <laughs> and, and so, you know, two, two guys looking at the same thing, well, they both decide that it's wrinkled, and so they sort of, it's a one or a zero. Yeah. But, but then when you get three and you say, which one's more wrinkled, it's tough. Yeah. 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 Not if you have a quantitative measure of wrinkling. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's lots of physicists out there who know what yeah. yeah, and there are probably a lot of genes in, in the genome that uh, modify the wrinkling. So well, that's yeah. that, 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 and that's where genetic. Comes. Well, this this is a, I got again this exact argument I said in a meeting a few weeks ago. We still don't know what causes wrinkles, and uh, you know, Roberto Coulter says yes, we do. It's Sinai and Sinar, you know, regulatory whatever. And, <laughs> but just because and, and so I had to correct myself. I said, well, you know, the genes that cause it. Certainly, I don't doubt that, but. Once you know that, what's the physics of the wrinkle? Why is it wrinkle? Okay. Mm -hmm. No points, or it may be a good time to conclude. So let's <laughs> thank all the speakers and all the discussion participants.